And with that, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Melissa Duncan and Jihan Gabart. So My Polar Inc. consists of Melissa and Jihan. They are a nonprofit organization that services the mental health community. Melissa is diagnosed with more than one mental health illness and chose to live a life larger than what society portrays possible. Her diagnosis was given over 10 years ago, consisting of bipolar one, OCD, and schizoaffective disorder. Jihan is currently her caregiver, a role that she was thrown into after witnessing the struggles of her childhood friend. A role unfamiliar for both embarked them on a journey and catapulted them into a movement to fight stigma and shed light on an example of when people love others with mental illness and what that can do. So My Polar Inc. has hosted many discussion panels on mental health awareness, mental illness, and the vital role of caregivers to someone with mental illness. They aren't just talking about it, they're proof you can thrive no matter the situation. Jihan Gabar is an interactive care advocate, founder of So My Polar Inc. and an owner of an IT consulting firm. She is on a mission to fight the stigma that affects those with mental illness and spread awareness. Her work in the community came from a place of love when she became Melissa Duncan's caregiver, a role at the time she was thrown into and didn't understand, but now wants to use her experience to help others. Melissa Duncan is a mental health thriver, founder of So My Polar Inc., and travels the country as an IT consultant. Melissa's condition presented at a very young age when she realized she was different from her peers. Receiving her diagnosis almost 10 years ago gave her a new voice. No one should have to feel the stigma from mental illness and no one should be afraid to seek help. Her work in awareness and breaking the stigma is just the beginning of a bigger picture of mental wellness. And with that, I will pass it over to Jihan and Melissa. Thank you so much for being here today. You're welcome. Thank you for having thank us. You so much. Thank you so much for having us. She recovers. And thank you so much to everyone that's out there that's joined. We see so many different places. We just want to say thank you again and hope you find this very, very informative. Yes. Um, Kelly did a great job by introducing us. <laughs> she thank did you, a Kelly. really detailed job. So again, my name is Melissa Duncan and this is Jihan Gabart. Um, well, let's get into it. Myself and Jahan thought about the title Crossing Paths, um, Mental Illness and Caregiving. I think it's something that so many people don't realize how important that is. These paths cross a lot, especially nowadays, and it's something that needs to be spoken about. I know we're all in a new space with what we've been going through for the last two years, but it's time now for us to use our voices to speak about what we've been dealing with privately. Really quick, I want to get into some facts from the nationalcouncil.org. One in five U.S. adults experience mental illness each year. One in 20 U.S. adults experience serious mental illness each year. One in six youth aged adults, excuse me, youth aged six to 17 experience mental health disorder each year. And 50% of all lifetime mental illnesses begin at 14. 75% begin at age 24. 14 and 24, they both mean a lot to me because at 14 was my first time being able to speak about my mental illness, which was to you. Right. And 24 is unfortunately when my mental illness peaked and I really, really needed help. Right. Um, so let's get into these diagnoses just really quickly. I know Kelly mentioned them, but just to give you guys an overview of what we're talking about and what we're dealing with, what I'm dealing with. Um, first, I'm diagnosed with OCD. OCD is a, a disorder in which people have recurring unwanted thoughts, ideas, sensations, basically obsessions that make them feel driven to do something repetitively, compulsions, repetitive behaviors such as hand washing, checking, checking on things, cleaning, so on and so forth. My second diagnosis is bipolar one disorder. Bipolar 1 is a mental health condition that causes extreme mood swings that include emotional highs, mania, and lows, depression. You've had at least one manic episode that may be preceded or followed by a major depressive episode. So that is what characterizes me as bipolar 1. And lastly, I'm diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. It's a mental health disorder that is marked by a combination of schizophrenia symptoms, such as hallucinations, or delusions, mood disorder symptoms, such as depression and mania. 
So it's kind of a mix of both. It sounds exciting, and sometimes it is, <laughs> but it's very hard to manage. Um, Jan, let's get into this then. I, I Wait, guess, yeah, go one ahead. One fact. Okay, let, let's do it. 40 million Americans provide care to one adult. 21% of the care recipients have emotional and mental illness. Wow. So this is, caregiving is something that's very popular. Wow. It's not spoken about, yeah. but it's very popular. Wow, those are some yes. really, really good numbers. I wanted to add that. Yeah, no. Um, all right, so we're talking about crossing paths. We're talking about caregiving. So let's cross these paths. <laughs> so let's do it. Um, let's do this. When did you realize you crossed paths with my mental illness? Did you identify which one? And what was that self-talk like for you? Okay, so there was an instance that happened years ago. We were in our early 20s and I had a spa treatment. You know, gonna go get a massage, relax. And um, Mel had to meet me to get some keys, something, something light, you know, meet up. And we had a dispute, you know, I was like, Mel, you know, talking to her about where she was parked in the middle of the street. So she didn't understand what I was saying. And before I knew it, the conversation had blown up out of nowhere. It just kind of got from zero to a hundred. And I'm late for my spa treatment. So I'm like, okay, we'll finish this later. I parked my car, got out of my car, walked into the spa, checked in, you know, saw Melissa and, you know, I'm speaking to her as I'm checking in like, okay, sis, we'll talk about this soon. And um, before long, Mel has followed me into my session as I'm walking in and she's yelling at the top of her lungs, trying to get her point across. And I'm saying to her, hey, Mel, like this is not the time nor the place. We're in an establishment. I have a treatment. It's pretty quiet here. And other customers are trying to relax. At that point, Mel, when I was telling you to calm down that you were right. Yes. That um, sent her the other way because I think she took it as I was trying to minimize, minimize her voice and I didn't want to hear her, but it was more of a time and place. So it wasn't about who was right, who was wrong, that we're talking about a parking spot. It was more you trying to get out what you wanted to say at that moment. Agreed. And at that moment, I realized, wow, um, we are dealing with something bigger than a bad day, you know, because Mel had had a couple of bad days prior to that, a couple of off months where, you know, the, um, excuses could have been made, excuses were made. 100%. But at this point, I think that it was building up and she didn't know, she didn't have an outlet. She didn't know what to do. And me being her, you know, her friend, her closest friend and us spending as much time as we spent together at that time, I was the only person that she took it out on. You know, at that time yeah. when I'm going to the spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, that's when I realized that that path had crossed. <laughs> yeah. um, I had no idea what was going on. Okay. But I did know something was different. Okay. And I did know something was building up. Okay. And at that moment, I realized that um, you needed to get help. Yeah. And there was, a contingency on our friendship okay. and I told you I, I remember and I told you I said hey you know after I finished my session after we were done we were able to speak and I said you know what now that everybody's listening on screaming and you know we're in the privacy of our own car we can talk mm -hmm. and we were able to get to a point that she needed to see that yeah. and you did yeah you're right and that's a that's a hard story to listen to but I want to know if you had, what was that? What, what, what were you saying to yourself? You know, we are always on two sides, but we cross a lot. And sometimes I want to know what inside, what was that self-talk for you? Like, um, I felt like at the time, whatever we were facing, mm -hmm. we were going to face together. Okay. Which we did. Yeah, we did. I didn't know we how had. hard that road was going to be for us. Mm -hmm. I, I had no idea what we were up against because like I said, by the time we were 25, that's when mental illness and most women peak. Yes. And you true. were peaking. Yes. And um, we, I, I had no idea what we were going with. Yes. But I was, as your friend, I was ready to take that ride. Yeah. And, you, and you have, and I appreciate that, number one. And I just figured, <laughs> hey, you know, whatever it is, we can do it together. Not realizing 
You was about to do OCD, bipolar one, and so I had no idea together. what that meant. Uh, <laughs> it was just a bunch of words when you gave me your diagnosis. And I was like, cool. Whatever. Oh, we'll do this together. Which we wind up, we did do. Yeah. We are doing. Right. But it was very, it was challenging. It is challenging. I, don't know. I love to hear your story. I, I love to hear mine, because but I'm living it, right? So I love to hear your story. We can laugh about it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's let's see what what else do we want to talk about then? Well, okay, so I can ask you the same question. Okay. When did you realize your mental illness crossed paths from our friendship into me taking on a caregiver role for you? That's a great question. Yeah. Um, it's a hard question for me to answer. I think a lot of people think, yes, I'm a mental health thriver, but being a thriver is always about pushing your own boundaries. Right. And these are uncomfortable boundaries, but we have to push through them. We had a really bad argument, I remember, some time ago. And unfortunately, it was driven when I was in a manic episode and also with alcohol. Mm -hmm. I'm very glad that I have since recovered and I haven't drank alcohol in so many years. And I'm very, very proud of that. And also you've helped me a lot with that. And thank you. But we had that conversation. Thank you. And it was about me and money. And one thing about my diagnosis, we do have bipolar spending. That's a symptom. So you tell me within my manic episode that I shouldn't, I can't, I can't afford mm. That's like three bad things to say. Um, and I didn't know that was a trigger. <laughs> didn't know. Yes. That was a part of me learning yes. what those three diagnoses entailed. Yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So after I agreed, I'm like, oh, okay, well, that's fine. We're going to do this. <laughs> yes. you, what, what would be a conversation for most? Like, hey, maybe that's out of your budget. Became a challenging conversation, yes. a yes. hard conversation yes. for us and a hard conversation for her to come to terms with yes. or a reality for her to come to terms with that she can't go and buy a condo building yeah. it, for example I, yeah yeah because I would well, I would have wanted to you know um but to answer your question honestly after that really bad argument I remember looking at myself and saying Mel you can't do this and it was the hardest thing that I had to say to myself because I didn't I didn't understand much, much about myself, even on right. my diagnosis at the time. But I remember saying, Mel, you can't do this. You need help. You need help. And the definition of a caregiver is to me so watered down, but it's somebody to me that can, that helps someone with something they genuinely just don't know how to do or they can't maybe at the time. And for me, I could not. And I didn't see it. I'm just like, why don't I have this? Why can't I afford this? Why I just want to just do everything and, and be everywhere and move around and not sleep and just stay up and do whatever. And that was my first time uh, we crossed paths from my perspective. And I said, no, you need this. You need this help. You yeah. need To receive help. me differently and yes. not combat. Yes, yes. Advice. Yes. Not, yes. not be combative when I'm in a nice, I'm, I'm speaking to you in a, in a well-toned. Yes. I'm, you know, there's no adjectives, no words used yeah, yeah, other than whatever the point was. Like, hey, maybe we should do this. It could be something as simple as that, that at those times would get you to another place yeah. that I didn't understand. Yeah. And for me, that, that was really hard. Yeah. And it was, yeah, it was hard. It was, hard. Yeah. And I, and I hate that. I hate that we went down that road, but this is the road to recovery, right? So crossing paths mental illness and caregiving that's yeah. the that's the whole point of this um all right so you have any facts or we can move on i want to ask you i got some other stuff i want to ask you okay well i have a i have a fact here okay so per the national alliance for caregivers the greater the needs of the recipient mm -hmm. the more often caregiving falls on the shoulders of a relative high burden caregivers in the u.s generally that is those providing the greatest hours of care and doing the most activities for their loved one are more often a relative 90% of the time. Okay. So basically saying people like myself fall into the role of caregiving more often, especially in severe cases of a mental diagnosis, we're here. Yeah. We're already here. Yeah. Um, when the diagnosis presents, we're not going to run. Yeah. You know, this is already a bond that has been established. Um, a mother to a child, a sister to, you know, a sibling, whatever. And um, yeah, 
that's how I got into my role, just being here and not bailing yeah. on what is considered a responsibility it is. because it is needed. It is, and I appreciate it, girl. Mm-hmm. Um, but those are some really good statistics. I think that is so much information out there. Kelly definitely has some links. Um, Carrie also can put some links up. It's a lot of good information out there, especially right now. So none of us can say that we don't know or we don't know how to find. It's everywhere. And that's that's the big part about this is right. that it's everywhere. Um, so let me ask you this. Mm-hmm. What is one thing you want people to know about being a caregiver to someone with a mental illness? And looking back, what would you have told yourself the moment you realized you transitioned to a caregiver? Great question. It, it became more of a, it's personal to me. Um, this wasn't a job. This wasn't a, when I can say it is a choice. Everything in life is a choice. But because it was so personal and because love is involved, it became an unspoken obligation to myself. Because in the face of it, you've been, you've been in this person's life for so long and a need presents, a heavy need, a need that there was, you know, just assessing the situation. There was no one else in your life at the time that could have stuck with you mm-hmm. and had the, the means and the mental capacity to help you. No, you know, at the time, I wasn't place. married. I didn't have any children. You know, it was just, you know, two girls having fun and you know when times weren't fun that wasn't going to be the I wasn't going to be the person to bail okay so saying that to say um just despite just just despite everything I was thinking at the time knowing now seeing the challenge it had just become an obligation to me to myself okay and it was something that I was set out to do okay okay and that was what would you want other people to know how would how would you relate to them that person that's just stepping into that role just realize like oh wow this is this is what I'm it's doing. a huge sacrifice okay. it's a huge sacrifice okay you're caring for the mental or you're helping mm-hmm. you know assist in the decisions the daily decisions of another grown person in my mm-hmm. situation yeah of course. um daily yeah. and sometimes a lot of times my needs had got pushed aside yeah. and the nature of our friendship, a lot of things would have, a lot of things I didn't share with them. I didn't have anyone to speak to. Yeah. I wasn't at the space. I wasn't in the place at the time to seek therapy or I didn't, I didn't know to seek therapy. Yeah. I, I was rolling with the punches and as things came, I dealt with them, but I felt like if I would speak to another friend or if I would speak to Um, my boyfriend at the time or anyone I felt like it would have been a betrayal to Mm -hmm. our friendship because bipolar one let's just be real Mm -hmm. hypersexuality Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. bipolar spending Mm -hmm. so at that point if I'm offloading to another person Mm -hmm. what you've offloaded to me that I have to help you with Mm -hmm. that can be considered what we call tea yeah true and that is your personal business yeah because now I'm divulging into your finances right now i'm divulging into your sex life and into your you know you your personal yes agree so i held it in i I mean at the time it was a good idea looking back i would i would i would definitely tell people to you have to find somebody to speak to even if it's somebody that somebody that doesn't know the person that you're caring for Mm -hmm. professionally um in, 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 in in any way because you can't help somebody if you don't know what you're up against. Mm. And it worked out. I was able to help Melissa and I've gotten some great, I mean, some great information to you and some great tactics over the years, but that was trial and error, yeah. but it did work out. Yeah. And I would just put your put yourself on a place to be great and talk to somebody professional so that they can lead you on how to lead this, a relationship of this nature. Mm, good advice. Good yeah. advice. Good advice. All right. Um, so let's see here. You have something? Yeah, well, I have a question. Okay, for you. So what is the one thing you want people to know about being mentally ill Mm -hmm. and having a caregiver? Mm -hmm. Looking back, what would you tell yourself at the moment you realized you transitioned to needing a caregiver as an independent woman because you're extremely independent? Um, So let's start at the end of your question, which was really a statement. I am am an independent woman. Mm -hmm. Woman, excuse me. 
a lot of people have such a big misconception about having mental illness. That doesn't mean that it's any, anything outside of a health condition. In that in this case, it's a mental health condition. That's it. If we can be able to drive that home, just like if somebody had high sugar, we wouldn't say, oh, here come the person, the insulin must be high. We wouldn't say that about them. We would see them, try to assist them, give them a candy, however however somebody would manage the, a diabetic in that point. Right. Mental illness is the same. Doesn't say, oh, that diabetic person, oh, they can't work. Obviously, it, it does have a physical aspect, but in the end of the day, it doesn't take on a personality. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing I want people to know. Your mental illness is not necessarily your personality. And we have to deal with it like that. So we can manage that versus manage ourselves in one ball. Um, the first thing I will say is, excuse me, the first thing, if I had to give someone advice about having, being mentally ill and having a caregiver, it's, it's okay. And I'm gonna say that again, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. And I'm repeating this over and over because I want people to understand that it is okay. I think that with mental illness and mental health, like you just said, it becomes such an exciting thing. It's almost so taboo that it's not medical anymore. Someone wouldn't say, oh, that person's having a heart attack. Oh, you know, it wouldn't be that way. So if I'm ha having a manic episode, it should be managed the same way. Right. It should be managed the same way. And it's okay. That's what I would say to that person. You need a caregiver. You need that assistant. You, you need help. It's okay. It's nothing wrong in that way other than you need help managing a health condition. So happen to be a mental health condition. And so looking okay. back, what would you tell yourself at the time you realized that you went from Melissa and Jan uh -huh. into a person now looking at your friend okay. as a caregiver mm -hmm. like you you know like you, so what, what i was, was that like well it was very hard for me just like you just said being an independent per independent woman is very hard for me i had that moment where it was like it was harder for me to accept that than my diagnosis being honest um, yeah. <laughs> it was like okay i'm oh, my, okay, sure. it's so quickly, okay ocd okay but oh so I really need someone to help me for yeah. real? It was a total different- That's where a lot of the struggle came from. 100%, yeah. it was a total different, um, different self-talk. But I would say to that person- To your old self. To my old self, yes. Look at, look at you, look at you. Look, have a great look in the mirror. Acknowledge what your mental health is and your mental illness is and acknowledge what you can manage and who you are and manage those things to the best of your ability. I felt like at the time, I balled myself over the ball. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I am OCD. I am bipolar one. I am schizoaffective, but that's not the truth. Right. That is not the truth. I wish that I would have said, no, we can do this and we can do this and we can manage this, but we can't manage this. We need help with this and we need help with that. Right. And I would have taken on my tasks and also being honest about the tasks I needed help with. How do you feel now? It's a good question. <laughs> I feel really great now. I feel, I feel very grateful. This story, this journey that we've had for so many years is so important to me because it is life for me. Right. Um, many of us, with, even within this conversation, understand certain, this is life for right. me. Um, it gave me life in different ways. Um, and I'm grateful. I feel eternally grateful. I'm, I feel proud. I feel proud of the work that I've done, the work that we've done, the work that yes. you've done. Um, and I feel great knowing that I am still diagnosed with mental illness. I have three of them, but it's okay. Right. It's okay. I'm here to tell people it's okay. it's okay. We will have hard days. We will have good days but it's okay. Yes. And I'm so grateful for us to be able to do this because it's okay. It's okay. It and I had that moment also okay. when okay. we were transitioning. I mean, there was a lot of, there was a, I wouldn't use the word shame, but I wanted to conceal 
the fact that I was doing this. Yeah, you know, because we were known as, you know, the fun it girls, you know, living, shopping, and just doing all that fun stuff, you know, and the lifestyle that I live, that, you know, that, that I live, you know, when you're at that age and you're, you know, in your early 20s, you're not really thinking that I, I knew what I needed to do. But you weren't thinking that this is the cool thing to do. I was 100%. thinking of judgment and not just, not, not for me. I was thinking for you because people, they, they already saw us in the light. But to know that whenever you got home, that I had to make sure, that, hey, there's, you know, yeah. are you okay? Yeah, make you know, sure who's lives. coming? Is anybody going home with you? And if so, it's okay, sis. You can just let me know if anybody's going to be there. No judgment. You know, just tell me. Yeah, yeah, You know what I mean? Let's just having to care for you. Just, yeah. Okay, are you going to be um, going shopping this weekend? You know, just those things that we had to, that I had to take the extra step to do. Yeah. I felt like a lot of judgment would come on us. Of course. You know, of people course. would look like you guys are weird. Yeah, and, you know, 100%. But and, and, and as I got older, I, I changed that, that mindset into, this is nothing to be ashamed. You know, this is everything that, this is who we are. Yes. And there's no reason to hide it. And no matter what people think, I mean, we're close. We've always yeah. been close. Right, right, right. And people aren't going to talk anyway. Yeah, yeah. And I just got to a point where I just didn't care anymore. Yeah. You know, but I, I, I had that transition moment where I just didn't want people to judge me, but of it course. wasn't really about me because it was so much, I was hiding so much I, for our relationship based on right, right. why, right. you know, right. the why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I did get questions at times and you know, none of your business, you know, nicely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <But>. um, <laughs> well, you know what, though? I think that people say, what's weird, right? Right. What's weird? What's different? What's all these different things? We've talked about this for years. Yes. For years. This conversation will and has been going on. I think the powerful part is it's going on for you guys. Yes. You know, this this is the power here because it's millions of people that are doing this, right. but they don't know. They don't they're not sure. They're feeling that shame. They're feeling that judgment. They're upset that they need help. They're wondering, I'm young, I'm doing this and I need, and I'm about to help this person do this. They're going through the same thing. But the power is this. Yeah. And we have to do this more because it's a generation behind us. Like you always say, I'm on my brother's keeper. Yes, yes. And the answer is yes. Even though people don't know each yes. other. The yes. answer is yes. You I don't know, know the person yeah. I'm holding the door for them walking behind me, but the answer is yes. Each one teach one. Yeah, right. the answer is yes. So um, vulnerability is something that's very new to me. You've always been a pretty vulnerable person, but I've always had so many layers of things that I wanted to hide. Um, you guys check out our ebook that we have. They'll put the link up. It's just um, some things that we came up with, quick tips of how to kind of get yourself jump started, accepting different things um, about yourself. But this is this journey for me is so personal. But the only way for it to be powerful is if it's public. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because it gets really personal. Anybody yeah. that has experienced any type of um, mental condition or caregiving for somebody with a mental illness, we all know that there's those moments and those those um, talks that you have when you get into like really what that person is going through, mm -hmm. and it becomes so like wow, you know, mm -hmm. like it's it, it it gets heavy. Yeah, you know, and that's great advice. Um, we want to of course open it up if you guys want to ask, but the biggest thing that you just said was amazing. Anyone stepping into that, this field, crossing paths, mental health, illness, and caregiving needs to get themselves some help. But they have to. Yeah, that was you, I mean, you have yeah. to some type of help. You have to have some type of outlet and know that it's okay. It's okay to do things, you know, and especially our dynamic, yeah. being friends. Yeah. You do most of your fun activities with your best girlfriend, yeah. you know, if she's available. Yeah. Um, and then you outsource to your other friends or she's, you know, you know how it is when you have a best friend. Yeah, yeah. But with this dynamic, it felt almost like I'm leaving you out on purpose, mm. which I was, mm. or which I should have, and I learned to do mm -hmm. because I just needed time to yes, you have to take care of yourself. And it's not that I didn't want to think about you. No, I understand. But I needed that time. So or true. again, my boyfriend at the time, who now is my husband. Mm. Thank God, yeah. <laughs> he didn't feel neglected. Listen, but we could do this for another couple of hours, right? So yeah. take time for yourself. Yeah. It's okay. Go out with people that are not a part of that circle. 
that that conversation won't come up that you just don't have to think about it for a couple of hours you have to take care of yourself yeah, you have to get a you therapist and you know just know that whatever's offloaded on you that could be a safe space for you to offload to someone else that you know mm-hmm. that that information won't be shared and it won't it, it won't be considered tea that yeah. people start you know circulating around certain circles where you feel like you're betraying that person yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. I think that it's very important. And I think for us with the mental illness is to know that we're, we're good enough. We're good enough. Yes. Sometimes we kind of stress. And I say we mean in the community that I represent. And I'm so proud of the mental health community because it's a part of who I am. And the recovery community. And the recovery community because it's a part of who I am as well. So we all start somewhere. Yes, it's true. And, it's true. You know, if we can all say thank God that we are not where we were 10 years ago. Yeah, and that's for that's us. That's successful. We may not be where we want to be, but if we're not where we started, that's amazing. That's, that, true. that's, that's true. That's a grace in itself that's and that's true. to be celebrated. I agree. So okay. with that, I want to give a stat. Okay. Um, an estimated 26% of Americans 18 and older, roughly one in four adults, suffer from a diagnosable mental disorder in a given year. Okay. Many people suffer from more than one mental disorder at a given time. Mm-hmm. In particular, depressive illnesses tend to co-occur with substance abuse and anxiety disorders. Agreed. 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 So I have a website that I'd like to share. Mm-hmm. It's um, mm-hmm. www.wellnessrecoveryactionplan.com mm-hmm. and the link will be posted. Yeah, okay. And that is something that um, is helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Um, so Kelly, or we can answer some questions or we can, you know, just continue to speak anything anyone is feeling wants to talk about. Even if it's private, you guys can go to our website, somapolar.org and our Instagram page, somapolar. Um, you can DM us. We always answer questions. Uh, it's just really important that we're available because yeah. we want to get this information out. Thank you so much. That was awesome. You can just feel the friendship between you two and how close you are and how you can just talk and riff off of stuff and just be completely open and honest. And that's so beautiful to see, especially with these types of topics that can be taboo. And a lot of people don't feel comfortable talking about them. So really just talking about them and talking about what they are and how you move through the world with these diagnoses is so powerful by itself. Wonderful. So I'm going to just look at the questions and comments we got. We did get one comment on the Facebook feed that I wanted to read that was really nice. Bipolar, BPD, major anxiety and major depressive over here. 60 days clean from drugs and alcohol and spending too much money. I really appreciate this conversation too much. So that was wonderful. That was one of our viewers from Facebook. Um, And then one of the questions that we had come in was... um, can you talk a little bit more about your nonprofit and how you started that and what kind of work you do? Great question. Great question. Um, you want to start? Oh, you can. So, so my polar came from a place of need. A lot of myself and Jehan looked around and we were like, look at us. Look at us. We are living a double life. Yes. <laughs> we are living we're double fabulous life. by day. The we're doors like, closed. We're just like we're hiding this thing. Trying to figure yeah, out a healthy to way to put it together and coexist. Coexist, normalize this thing, even within us. Yeah. So Jan said, you know what, Mel, you gotta use this. She she told me one day, she said, I'm not comfortable telling this story if you're not. And I, I had to look at myself and say, you know what? I, I, I can't hold the story because it's it's that important and needs to be told. Right. But when I'm ready, I can tell mine. So um, we started So My Polar maybe about five, four or five years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, we always work in the community. Philanthropy is something that we both grew up to within our cultural background. It's kind of something that we were both raised in. Right. Um, being a kid, passing out food, just doing so many things. So we've always been in the community helping. So we never put a tag on it. We never even took a picture of it. We, right. we sponsored so many different women <laughs> and so many children and so many breakfasts and dinners and everything. But for us, and holiday, and dinners. holiday dinners, but for us, it was our push out, right? So we're doing this and we're hiding this thing. So we're, we're able to dump this, this in this place. Yeah. So it was a safe space for us to help. And then and we heal without having to talk. Right. But which we were, was kind of unfair. Which was unfair because we were only giving half of the 
story. Exactly. Some of those people might could have benefited from of course. that. But we were just like, hey, you we know. We would have normalized it at yes. those moments, you yeah. know. Yeah. You know, being, you know, in the industries that we're in. Agreed. And being able to come back and, you know, do, you know, do these dinners Agreed. and give to these Agreed. communities, Agreed. you know, for us to have this relationship and you have the diagnosis that you have and then we can come and help people agree like that it would have it would have been so much more powerful I if agree. we would have spoken up earlier yeah. but we weren't ready and, and we, that is we weren't ready that is a sensitive thing. and it is um but now we are so soma polar is an organization that services the community and the mental health community recovery community we service the community in general um so if you go to our site you'll see different information about us we have an ebook we have different books coming out we have projects that we work on we do discussion panels virtually we're in south florida so we do a lot in south florida but um so my polar just started from a need and yes. it, it really did and a need for both of us that we didn't even know yeah. that we needed to fill. <laughs> you know so that's the long and the short of it yes, yes. Beautiful. I think it was a definite need and I'm sure it feels like a relief that you can both be honest and open about your story wherever and a living example of a really good. Yes. There's no misconception. You don't have to ask. You can kind of just go to the Instagram and just see what we're going yeah, through. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's so authenticity. You, kind of, you know, figure it out yourself. Yeah, listen, so, take yeah. something back. You know, yeah. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to go to the next question. Um, as a caregiver that experienced a crisis situation with an adult family member in an emergency room situation, I felt a lack of empathy and a judgmental ER staff. Is that a common scenario? Yes. So because you're vested in that person, that's your, that's your family member, that's your heart, that's, your, that's the person that you love. Um, we often feel that they're not going to get or not getting the care that they need, especially when you're witnessing it. There's times that, you know, I've been in that situation you know, and I'm very critical on the care team, you know, because we do have a care team in place and I have a somewhat um, relationship with them that Melissa, of course, has put me down to be able to speak to them about certain things. And, you know, and sometimes in those ER situations, it's not enough time because it's a fast paced environment that you can't sit down and talk with the care, the, um, the care team there, you know? So yes, that's extremely normal. And that's, you know, it's sad, but this is your, this is your heartbeat, not theirs. They're just there to, you know, fulfill a service. And in that aware. moment, what would you, that person sounds like it's a pain there in that moment. What would you tell them? What would you tell You've been there with me. I, I've been I just yards. ask every question. Sure. I don't allow anyone to tell me anything. If I know I saw something, if I know that this person does not need to be discharged, needs some type of um, more, maybe a higher dose of dosage of medication right, or, or you know, whatever, you know, something, yeah. I speak up. Yeah, speak I, I up. speak up. You don't let anybody tell you something that you know, especially that you're witnessing and you were there, whatever, whatever occurred. You know, you speak up. Yeah, you, yeah. you don't. They're at work. I mean, let's just be honest. They're at work. Mm -hmm. This is your. This is your love. This is your life, and you rally for that. That's good. That's yeah. good. That's good. Yeah, I think that's so true. After everything, those people are at work, and maybe they have something going on in their personal lives, um, and they don't really understand or really dive into it deeper because they just don't know, and they don't know the person like you do. So I think that's a wonderful answer. You know, and a lot of times one treatment is for most patients, you know, and that's not how it is. Everybody needs their yes, individual Taylor, treatment agree. plan to whatever they're going through. So take um, whatever you have as far as medication, treatment, therapy, whatever you know about that individual, you share that with that care team. You educate them as much as you can. Yes, they know medicine, but they know medicine. They don't know the individual. Mm -hmm. Right. They don't have the whole history. Exactly. You just mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay. So we had a question come in through Facebook um, that says by living independently, Melissa, do you mean you are able to work and support yourself financially and live on your own? Good question. Um, so first answer, I am able to work. 
<laughs> I am able to support myself financially with the with certain barriers that are in place, barriers to ensure that when I unfortunately get into manic episodes and different episodes, I don't use all the resources. So I do have barriers in place with Jahan to ensure that I'm working, but that I'm not like spending. Yeah, <laughs> spending and be, you know, using it recklessly because that's unfortunately a part of it. I am able to live on my own. Um, it was a lot of work. It was really, really hard. I was totally afraid. Um, OCD is an anxiety disorder. So I was super afraid for us to have a break in that kind of way. For so many years, I just lived with Jan. I was like, oh, fine, I'm just living here, it's okay. But it came a point where Jan, being an amazing caregiver, best friend, just amazing person, said, Mel, you could do this. I remember that day, you said, Mel, you got I told this. her, I said, listen, I said, there can only be one queen in this palace. <laughs> she's a Leo, so she's very opinionated and she's very strong in how she likes it. So I said, listen, listen, it's time. There's a nice condo down the street, <laughs> not even a mile away. <laughs> yeah. And I needed that reassurance. <laughs> uh, I needed that reassurance because like I said in the beginning of our conversation, yes, I have um, um, mental illness, but I also have a personality, right? So it's for me to manage that much of my side, but knowing those other things I need help with. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize that I could do it. I didn't believe I could. Oh, pay rent on time? Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> I did it. But I'm so happy that you really, you took that off. Because I know you, you took that off. And you looked at Melissa as a person. Right. And you said, you got this. I mean, I mean that. You were, you're financially stable. Yeah. There's no reason other than, you know, needing help with budgeting and just different yeah. things that regular, you know, like, do you have people out there that just don't know how to budget? You're not the one. Mm -hmm. So putting those parameters in place, like, hey, this, 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 you know, I'm good with numbers. Fine. Wonderful. Um, and our next question came through on the webinar, and the question is: Melissa, do you cycle bipolar? For example, every three months. How did you get your diagnosis? Did you have many different doctors? And how do you balance? Mm, good, a bunch of good questions. Um, so, do I cycle? Unfortunately, I do. It's the worst feeling in the world. Um, I want people to understand, just like we say, it's like health condition. It's like anything else. It's like, oh, I have arthritis. My fist, I can't move my fist today. It's the same with mental illness, and it's the same with bipolar. Oh, I'm cycling. Yes, one minute I am crying, and the next minute I am laughing, and I'm talking to some, and I'm talking to people, and they're not following me. And for me, it's to makes total sense. It's just like, I was just sad, yeah, but now I'm glad again, it's time to move on. But they're not following me and I understand that, you know? But it's a health condition and it works the same way, right? Yes, unfortunately I do. It's very uncomfortable because I'm aware. I'm aware that I just cried, I get it. <laughs> and I get that I'm laughing now and I, I'm aware that I just wanted to go out and then you call me back and it's like, I'm not even gonna answer the phone because I, I physically can't get up because I feel so, you know, torn, pulled down. So yeah, I do, it's very uncomfortable, but through Jan has helped me a lot with different um, wellness tips and tactics and works with the care team for me. And I definitely am a part of that too. I manage it through medication and wellness management. Um, wow. What was the other two? I hate this. <laughs> Short-term memory is a, is a um, symptom of bipolar one, so unfortunately. <laughs> no problem. I think the other part of that question was just, um, have you had several different doctors and how do you balance it all? Yes, I have had several different doctors. Um, it's a journey. Just like that caregiver question, it was amazing. Just like Jan mentioned, she's been in that scenario. Um, having to advocate. It's a journey because we're still turning that corner where mental health is just an illness. It's not a big deal. It's not a T. It's not a, oh, let's get some cameras out. This person is just sick. Yeah. I've had doctors that I go to them and they say, oh, no, it's nothing wrong. Look at you. No, you're fine. I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not, I'm not. I need help. I've had people like, oh, no. Racing thoughts. No, you're fine. I've, I've had so many people invalidate this thing. Right. Like, I don't even understand how you can do that, but that's fine. But 
to answer the question, it's just, I've had a lot of different doctors. These conversations are needed from caregiver crossing paths with mental illness because they need our perspective. They need to know that you're talking to somebody. Even yes. as medical professionals, they still use those words that they don't realize. You. Yeah. I'm right. coming to you for help. Yeah. yeah. Help me. Yeah. Please. Don't tell don't me. Don't tell me I look normal. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, no, we're we all do. We Thank all God. Do. Yeah. But I, I need your help. Yeah. yeah. So I've had several and I've worked through that. Jan has helped me work through a lot of them, but we have a good, strong care team now. Thank God. Thank God. Yeah. Um, and last question, how do I manage? I manage by trying to be as mindful as I can, um, being honest about when I'm feeling different things. So I might call Jan and say, listen, um, I've been cycling a lot. I was supposed to sleep last night. I lay in the bed and so I fall asleep at all. Or, you know, I'm just not feeling happy but I don't know why so I'm very honest about how I feel or I'm having recent thoughts it just keeps focusing on this one thing I don't you know just different things I try to be as vulnerable as I can for me that's how that's how I manage vulnerability is one of the biggest things that I struggled with for so long and it held me back and it held me down mm -hmm. um so for me managing is being vulnerable saying right. hey I need help I'm on this wellness thing. I want a soda. I want a piece of candy. I just, I just want to do whatever, but I need help. I need help, you know, just being honest about that. So for right. me, vulnerability is how I manage. It's just always being honest with myself and Jan and my care team and everybody who's involved in my life. Wonderful. Yeah, I think it's, you know, trusting yourself when you don't feel good and you're having those um, situations where you're just feeling off and trusting yourself and asking for help and being aware about that and advocating for yourself is so important. And that can be hard in the beginning where we're not sure what's going on and what our diagnoses are and what we need help with. So I definitely think kind of trusting ourselves for a lot of us that are in recovery, that's like one of the things we have to learn how to do. Yes, yes, you have to, yes. believe. You have to believe, I agree. Awesome. Um, let me see where we are with questions. We have a few more. Um, okay, the next one that came in says, what is the caregiving like in day-to-day -day life? Is there any type of line between caregiving and friendship? Whatever that is, that's a smart question. Great mm -hmm. question. Um, myself and Melissa um, are extremely close. And at the point where I transitioned in our earlier, in our early 20s, I started to build boundaries where I had to give Melissa responsibility to know when it was okay, how to speak to me. Because sometimes um, being a caregiver takes me out of being a friend. Mm. And Melissa would look at me as if I worked somewhere. Mm. It's like, hey, I'm not working. I'm, I'm here. I'm here because I want to be here. You know, this is not something that you know, we can put, um, I'm not doing this because I'm getting paid. This, you're my sister, you know, like a sister, whatever. And um, I, I just had to put boundaries on it. And our day-to-day -day life now, we've, we've kind of adjusted where we know who each other, we know our, our places, mm -hmm. you know, we know our spaces. Mm -hmm. And we understand that whenever the tone may change in a conversation, I think that we both understand what hat we're putting on at that time. Mm -hmm. Because the conversation can go from, hey girl, did you like that shirt? And <laughs> during the conversation, it could be, yeah, I'm going to go and buy five of them. And then I have to get into that, well, you know, you know, I have to put on my professional, you know, in a friendly conversation. So it immediately transitions into something where it's like, maybe that's not a good idea. And then at that point, I think with those quick transitions, it kind of gets a light bulb for both of us where we transition in and then we can transition out really quick before it can escalate. And that is how it is day to day. I mean, this is this is who I've dance. grown into. This is who this is how Melissa's mind works. And she's going to throw these things out at me as they say she tries it. So I just have to I, was, I don't know. I just have to kind of roll with those times and and, you know. Just go with the flow. Yeah. And obviously you have so much information too. Yeah. Remember, ask that question. Get as much information as you can so you yeah. know what you're battling. Yeah. Sometimes you have more information than I do. Yeah. Like, there was a time I didn't know. You know, I didn't know how to 
answer these questions where to me it would sound redundant. It would sound, it would frustrate me. And I would answer in a way that would upset you. Mm -hmm. But to me, it's like, didn't we go over this yesterday? Mm -hmm. And for her, it's like, I want to buy another car, you know? So we were, we were on two different, right, right. you know, spectrums. Yeah. And we, I had to figure out a way to bring those two together healthily where we can talk through it and we can transition right back out yeah. and get back to, should yeah. I buy this shirt or not? <laughs> right. Uh, no, right. Right. That baseline. Yeah. That baseline. Yeah. yeah. So, but right. all in all, we're still friends. Um, it, it's a journey, but there you still have your friends. Yeah. And I think at the end of the day, that's worth more than anything. You still have that person, you know, with, with this plethora of information that I've gathered and I've learned and I can now help other people yeah, yeah. outside of a personal relationship. Yes. And it seems like because you're so close and you have such a strong friendship, that's why this caregiving relationship can also thrive. It's because you have that foundation of love and you both understand boundaries and you're work, constantly working on those. And like you said, it's a journey that you just keep learning and keep growing. This isn't, it, it's, it, it's, we still have our, um, you know, our time. Oh yeah. So we still have those oh, times yeah. where we, we just yeah. know how to argue healthy. Yes. Agreed. 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 And you know, you know when you're talking to Melissa and then when you're talking to my mental illness, because it's different. I have a personality, I'm, I'm Mel, but then Mel has symptoms that spin off. That's not Mel's personality. And you manage that hundred percent. One thing that I want to say about caregiving is we need a safe word also, where that person needs to know to stop. Mm -hmm. We have that. Yeah. And that was um, developed in more recent years of our friendship because there were times that Melissa would literally, like when she followed me into the spa, that wasn't the only time she did that. That was just public. This would happen around the house. This would happen through phone calls, through if, if the conversation is like, you know what, I'm hanging up, text messages, calling back. Let's let this breathe for a few minutes. Yeah. So now, whenever we're having these, um, whenever we're having these disputes or we're just not seeing eye to eye, I have a safe word. Like, listen, we're going to stop now. Oh, wow. you know, I, have a, I have a two year old son. <laughs> I have a husband. I have other things that I'm going to go and tend to. And you're going to be okay. And call me back after you think this through. The so responsibility, given that responsibility. I gave you that responsibility. Yeah. I gave you contingencies and it worked out. Yeah. Well, it's working out. Yeah, while you're working on yourself. Yeah, while you're working. Because we're still yourself. people too. Yeah. And we need to let um, the person that we're caring, caring for know. It's not all about your needs 100%. only because 100%. what we take on, what we're taking with us is very burdensome. And there's times that, hey, I, I, I need five minutes, bro. Like I need this time. I agree. I agree. So always remember that. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Good advice. Oh, and the piece of that question was, when did I get diagnosed? How long? Right. I think that was part of it. Mm -hmm. um, I want to, that was about 11 years ago. So this, is this has been going for a while, <laughs> a while, right. a while. So about 11 years ago. I just remembered that part. Sorry. Right. Go ahead. Yes. Awesome. Um, okay. I think we have time for one more question. Um, and the one that we had pop up, uh, Melissa, so how did you change your mindset from feeling like you just have these diagnoses to being a human being, just living with a health condition? That's a great question. Um, it was very difficult. It was real. I'm not, that's one thing I think with mental illness, mental health recovery, we had to be honest about how hard it is because it's okay. It makes us, it makes us know we got it. But we say, oh, I got it. It's easy. No, 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 no. It gives us less. We have to take it. And it was so hard for me to see that Mel could have a life. Mel could be a person. Mel could be love. Mel could deserve love and carry these things around. Because for years, I felt like I had a black plastic bag, the big heavy ones, on my shoulder. And I was just dragging them around, which was myself and all these diagnoses in this bag. And I would so often ask Jahan, girl, can you help me lift this bag up? But I didn't understand myself enough to know we can let go of this bag. 
we can unpack this bag, take out what we need, yeah, and sure. we can put, put our hands, wash our hands, knowing that it's me and I'm good. Can't you change know? it. And I can't change it. Yeah. And I'm glad because I'm me. Make the best of it. Yeah. Life. But it was hard. Whoever we'll asked that question, it was hard. If you're going through that, if you have been through that, I understand it is hard. But I had to look at myself and say the reverse. I do deserve love. I do deserve um, a chance to be. And these things won't hold me back. Right, and take off the stigma and take off of stigma. mental illness yeah. and not live with that guilt or shame yeah. in the, in, and in that closet. And once yeah. you can free yourself, and I'm, I'm speaking from a standpoint of helping Melissa and watching her go from someone who was so bottled off and just, you know, yeah. shameful to someone who one day, you know, or not just one day, but who developed an attitude. I'm like everyone else. Yeah. I'm going to choose to live this way. Yeah. And no matter how hard the choice may be, it is hard. And I can totally, you know, agree with that. It just needed to be done. Yeah. Because like somebody needs to take your insulin, their insulin, you need to take your medication yeah, also. I agree. And yeah. we're all humans and we all deserve love and we all deserve we all deserve that chance. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And you can do it, yeah. whoever you are. Yeah, thank you. And this organization <laughs> is amazing. Yeah. Just for us to say that quickly, she recovers is amazing. It's something that we both saw and yes. we had to be a part of it because we all recover from yes. thing. every she every he, all he, we all recover from something and i think your organization touched us in that kind of way and it was beautiful a so voice for women yes yes, yes. no matter what yes no yes. matter and and one of our intentions and guiding principles is when we're ready we recover out loud so other women can find us and join our movement so this is Perfect. It's a perfect note to end on. And we are so glad that you joined us today because this was very inspiring. If you have a chance to scroll through the chat or go back later to the Facebook page and look at the comments, there's tons of wonderful comments of this resonating with people who came today. And we're just so thankful for you both. Thank you, You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa and Jahan for your time, for your heart, your experience. Thank you to everyone else who makes this series possible. And most importantly, thank you to all of our viewers for coming today, showing up, holding space and bringing forward your awesome questions. We truly are stronger together. Next Monday, we have She Recovers coaches, Leslie McNabb and Dufflin Lammers, who will be helping us learn about sex and recovery. And it's also Galentine's Day and we have extended gatherings that evening on Zoom. For more information about Mental Health Mondays, and all of our upcoming sessions, please visit sherecovers.org slash mental health Mondays. For more information about She Recovers Foundation and all of our recovery focused programs, resources, and touch points, please visit sherecovers.org. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>